Officially then, good evening to everyone that's uh, connected via the web tonight and to those who will watch this later uh, via recording. I'll give you a little bit of background to the Bible study this evening. A couple of years ago, while I was wrapping up a Bible study for North Dakota, and I was only pastoring there at the time, but as I wrapped up the study, uh, I remember asking if anyone had a suggested topic or something that they would like to see covered in a future Bible study. And one gentleman asked or requested, why don't you do a Bible study on the book of Proverbs? And that's been on my mind ever since. And I'm finally uh, actually doing it. And there are some real challenges that go with this. As a matter of fact, our own Beyond Today Bible commentary has probably, and I didn't, I didn't do a comparison with other books, but I've used our commentary a lot, and I believe the introduction to the book of Proverbs is longer than any other introduction or background that we have on any of the books of the Bible in our own commentary. And, and that tells you something. In some ways, it's not an easy book to follow if you're looking for a lineal narrative. In other words, you know, start to finish, it's got a central theme that's easy to follow. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's just, uh, let's pick the book of Esther. You know, from the beginning of that book, it's reasonably easy to follow the story. You have this man and his wife, uh, Naomi and two sons, because of famine in the land, they go over to the land of Moab. And no need to review too much of that. I think we're pretty, f I'm sorry. I said, Esther, I'm talking about Ruth, aren't I? <laughs> the book of Ruth. But again, um, they go over to Moab. Uh, uh, the two sons marry there. One of them marries Ruth, the Moabitess. And in the course of time, all three men die. Naomi's husband dies, both of her sons die, and so she ends up coming back ultimately uh, into Israel with her one daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabitess, who refused to leave her. And then you have the story of their land being, Naomi's land that is being redeemed by the relative Boaz, Ruth marries him. Very interesting story, and it's fairly lineal. You can follow it straight on through. Now, in the book of Proverbs, you're not going to find that. Uh, it doesn't have a continuous story flow. Matter of fact, as I was preparing over the past week and more, I thought of a scripture in Isaiah 28, and I'm, I'm not going to turn to Isaiah 28, but there's a scripture there, and it's repeated. It says, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Uh, now, there's some greater meaning back there, but you probably remember that. And again, it's repeated, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And that describes the book of Proverbs. On the other hand, Proverbs is absolutely full of precious and often very short precepts that are guides for living a productive, rewarding, godly life. In the way of introduction, what is a proverb? Here are a couple of definitions, and this is coming out of our Beyond Today Bible commentary. Here's one definition of a proverb. It is a memorable short saying summarizing a time-tested truth. Here's a second definition. Proverbs are pithy statements that summarize in a few short words practical truths relating to some aspect of everyday life. And I think that's true. They're very practical. And I really want to get into uh, that tonight. But I also want to do a little more background. Matter of fact, I, I, I just felt I had to do some more background to this one that I would usually do. And uh, I hope you find even the background meaningful. Now, I'm going to turn to Proverbs 
16 only because it's an example of what I said about not being real lineal. Uh, you'll have one concept in one verse, another concept in another verse, another in the following verse. And I just looked randomly. It's pretty easy to find these, but in Proverbs 16, right near the end of the chapter, Proverbs 16, verse 31. Verse 31 says, The silver-haired head is a crown of glory. It is found in the way, or excuse me, if it is found in the way of righteousness. Very next verse. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Next verse. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Now, we only read three verses, but do you see three different concepts there? And that's fairly common in the book of Proverbs. And before I uh, finish the study tonight, I want to uh, get on a topic and then see how you have to uh, pick the verses throughout the book of Proverbs in most cases to really get the meaning. That's just the way that God inspired it. So again, there are numerous threads of information on many topics that are invaluable to us in the book of Proverbs. But I want to now turn to the beginning of the book of Proverbs, and I anticipate doing at least a few Bible studies on this uh, book of Proverbs because there is so much to cover in it, and we'll see if this goes well then I'll determine how I will progress with these. But if we go all the way back to the beginning of the book, the book of Proverbs, we're going to see the purpose for which this book was written. Proverbs chapter 1, if you're back there with me, I'm only going to read the uh, first four verses here. First of all, verse 1 of Proverbs 1, the Proverbs of Solomon. Solomon, who compiled this book, he being the son of David, king of Israel. So we know exactly who we're talking about here and who compiled this. Verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. So contained within these short verses is the purpose for which the book was written. And it's timeless. I assure you, it's timeless, even though... Uh, these were compiled by Solomon or put together close to 3,000 years ago. Again, to receive instruction of wisdom. I'm not going to uh, do a lot to break these verses down right now, but justice, judgment, equity, how much those things are needed today, and you and I need to keep learning them to give prudence to the simple. That's not insulting. You know, we, we all started out simple in the sense of not understanding God's way. But this book sure helps us. And a lot of us have been studying this for a long time, but we continue to learn. But I do want to emphasize again that last part of verse 4. This is primarily written to the young man the young man, knowledge and discretion. But don't take that to mean that it doesn't have a tremendous value for old and young, men and women, boys and girls. I've often said in the past, I haven't said this so much recently, but Proverbs is great for young people. And it doesn't require a great depth of spiritual understanding in most cases. But it sure has a lot of good practical direction in, in life, in living life. 
Now, I want to go into some of the background here regarding the author. We all know who Solomon is. As I put in the uh, notice of the Bible study, let's have a hard conversation, if I could put it that way, about Solomon. Now, let's be honest, before God and with ourselves, Solomon is something of an enigma. Do you agree with me? Well, and maybe you're saying, well, what, what's that word? Well, an enigma means a person or thing that is mysterious, puzzling, or difficult to understand, and specific to a person. A, if you use that word enigma to describe Solomon, here's a definition. It's a person of puzzling or contradictory character. And I believe that describes Solomon. Because of what we read about the end of his life, it's easy sometimes to overlook some of his wise instruction. And I think, we, well, I'm going to talk about some of this real shortly, but we know how his life ended, at least the way we have it recorded, especially in the book of First Kings. And that can take away the credibility of what he wrote. And we have to be careful with that. And I admit, I've, I've wrestled with that myself. How seriously can I take the words of a man who really didn't, if you would accept this, Practice what he preached. Let's go back to First Kings. Uh, Solomon is certainly mentioned in other places, but Solomon's life is chronicled in the Bible. First of all, in First Kings, the first eleven chapters. So, if you'd go back to First Kings, chapter eleven, please. His uh, life is also chronicled in the book of Second Chronicles. Chapters 1 through 9. But if you would join me in 1 Kings chapter 11, I'd like to read the first eight verses with you. Now we're starting here looking at the end of Solomon's life, but I have a reason for doing this. 1 Kings 11, the very first verse. But King Solomon loved many foreign women. There's a key word, foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, the daughter of Pharaoh is mentioned in Scripture as the first woman that he married, but he married many more. Continuing, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. Verse 2, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. And that was a specific command, a specific command in Scripture, not to marry outside of the faith, as we might put it today. But back in that era, God was dealing with his nation, and he did not want them intermarrying with these other nations who were out-and-out out pagan in their customs and practices. And if you uh, continue with me in the Verse 2, where we were, it says this, Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And the Hebrew word love there is nearly always used specific to the love between a man and a woman. And that's not necessarily wrong, but who is he giving his love to? Verse 3. He had 700 wives, princesses. And many modern translations will say something to the effect he had 700 wives of royal or noble birth and 300 concubines. And I think we understand a concubine is a wife, but in the social strata of the time, a concubine was, and I've often described it this way, simply a servant wife. One example would be Hagar. And I don't want to turn back there, but <clears throat> as you recall, when 
Sarah and Abraham could not have children. Sarah gave her handmaid, remember that, her handmaid to Abraham, and he took her as his wife. So truly she is a wife, but remember, she remained a handmaid. And so I think that describes a little bit the difference between what it says, wives and then concubines. So you add it all up, it's 1,000. Now, if they were all living at the same time, I don't know. Uh, one of the commentaries say these, uh, this is it's some exaggeration for effect, nice even numbers. Uh, well, I don't know, but I'm very comfortable saying he had a lot of women as his wives and concubines. What is more important than the number here is rest of verse 3, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. So here's a big character flaw that came up, I'm going to put it this way, late in life, when Solomon was old. Now, very likely, many of you connected this evening are older than Solomon was at his death. As a matter of fact, I am probably older than Solomon was at his death. Uh, to help prepare for this, I was listening to a class done at the uh, ABC, our Ambassador Bible College, by Dr. Erwiller. And in, the, in his introduction, he was always also touching on these things. Now, we don't know how old Solomon was when he became king. What we do know is he reigned 40 years and he died. But if we back up prior to the 40 years, how old was he? Dr. Erwiller uh, gave a pretty wide range. He was somewhere between 15 and 25 years old. But even if you take the high number, 25, and then add the 40 years in which he reigned, that's only 65 years of age. So late in life, he makes this sharp left turn, if you will, and it's sad. Read on with me, verse 5. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. And it continues, verse 7. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh the abomination of Moab on the hill that is east of Jerusalem. You know what? This, What's the hill sometimes called the mount in Scripture east of Jerusalem? Well, it's the Mount of Olives. It's just right there in the capital city, and he's doing all of this. Now, continuing. And he also built this a high place for Molech, the abomination of the people of of Ammon, and he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. But he was complicit in this, and some commentaries will tell you he was also active in worship of them. The scripture doesn't exactly say that, but regardless, what he did was extremely evil. I'll read a few things from uh, commentaries here. This is from uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. Solomon's extraordinary gift of wisdom was not sufficient to preserve him from falling into grievous and fatal errors. Deuteronomy 17, verses 16 through 17. I won't turn there, but you can note it if you wish. Deuteronomy 17, verses 16 and 17, explicitly says kings were not to multiply for themselves horses, wives, and silver or gold. Those three items, horses, wives, and then the precious metal, silver or gold. Solomon did all of those things. As a matter of fact, you know, the statement is made about him that he had so much gold within his realm, within the kingdom, that silver became as nothing and was counted as nothing during his reign. 
he had incredible wealth. Now, we've already mentioned that he married wives from people that the Lord had specifically forbidden Israel to intermarry with. Deuteronomy 7, verses 3 and 4. It's actually stated in more than one place, but in Deuteronomy 7, verses 3 and 4, that is explicitly stated, and Solomon would have known this instruction. But late in life, he chose to ignore it. Now, a little bit about the idolatry. Ashtoreth, singular, was a goddess of love, a chief female deity. Milcom is associated with Molech, and then Molech is actually mentioned later in the verses I read. Do you remember something about Molech? The god Molech was one to which people sacrificed their children. Child sacrifice. That's what was done to honor Molech. Chemosh was a sun god who also brought victory in war. And you can find other uh, definitions of these gods, but it's enough. Now, I don't want to go deeply into this, but it's horrible. And yet that's what Solomon fell into late in life. You know, Proverbs 16, which I read to you, verse 31, was actually written by Solomon. The gray head, the hoary head, depending on what uh, uh, translation you're reading, is a crown of honor. If it be found in righteousness. And yet he himself forgot or chose to ignore what he had been inspired to write. Now, I want to go on, though. It's enough of the real negative. And maybe you're more noble than me, but I would have to admit this has, what I just read, has influenced my view of Solomon and consequently what he wrote in the past. But I studied more deeply into it this time than I have before. I want to turn this positive, and let's look at this incredible wisdom that Solomon had. Now, the source of that is very important. First Kings, I assume your Bibles are still open to First Kings. Now, turn back to First Kings chapter 3. First Kings chapter 3. I won't have time to read a lot of this, but in verse 5, first uh, Kings 3, verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? And so Solomon uh, answers, you know, well, you've shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth and righteousness. And, you know, you've continued this kindness to him because you've given him a son to sit on his throne. Now he's speaking of himself. Verse 7, now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant. In other words, you've made me king instead of my father David. And notice what he said, but I am a little child. That's figurative. Now, he was young, but he wasn't a child. But he realized how inadequate he was. He said, I don't know how to go out or come in. I just don't know how to conduct myself wisely as a king. And then he goes on about the great number of people over which he was given responsibility. Verse 9, therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, that I can truly see motives. That's what he's asking for. He says, who is able to judge this great people of yours? I have to rule over these people. He was taking it very seriously. Verse 10, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And he said, verse 11, the, God said that because you have asked this thing and didn't ask for long life, the life of your enemies and so forth, he said, but have asked, end of verse 11, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, verse 12, I have done according to your words. Notice the next part of the verse. See, I have given you a wise heart, 
or a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. This is the incredible depth of wisdom and discernment and knowledge that the Lord right then and there was going to give Solomon. It's, 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 it's amazing, and it's very inspiring to me. And, you know, he began to exhibit that immediately. Later on in this uh, same chapter, we've got the account of the two harlots who had both had babies, and one of the uh, harlot mothers had rolled over, apparently, and smothered her child. She takes the living child of the other woman, uh, the other woman awakens, realizes she's taken my baby, and they get into this fight. I, maybe, well, yeah, I'll use that word. And they come all the way to Solomon. And remember how he figured that out. Remember, he said, bring a sword. Now, I don't know if he intended to carry that out, but they certainly perceived he would. And then, of course, the one mother says, no, no, it's okay. Just give the baby to her. Well, now he knows who the real mother is, doesn't he? She's the one that can't bear to see her child cut in two. And the other one is cold. He, that, that, I mean, you could mull over that, that account for a long time. That's the wisdom that was given to this man. But let's read a little more about it in 1 Kings 4. The very next chapter, 1 Kings 4, verse 29. Verse 29, and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. Uh, let's see how much I want to read here. I have to be careful. I don't have a, a whole lot of time. Well, let's continue. Verse 30, Solomon's wisdom exceeded the wisdom of all the men of the east. And the men of the east... That's where later nations like uh, Babylon and Persia developed. A lot of uh, sharp people over there, too, but his wisdom exceeded all of those. Verse 31, he was wiser than all men, and it, it names a number of others. But the end of the verse, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, verse 32, and his songs were 1,005. We don't even have all of these, uh, even though this book of Proverbs we're going to study later is pretty lengthy, but we don't even have them all. Verse 33, notice some of the uh, expanse of his knowledge. Also, he spoke of trees, from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. In other words, small trees to very large. And it continues. He spoke of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Just absorb that for a moment. People are coming from far away places to hear his wisdom. We have one specific account of that, and it's in Second Chronicles. And I would like to go to that one and read just a little bit of it. In Second Chronicles chapter 9. In Second Chronicles chapter 9, we've got the specific incident where a, a ruler, a queen in this case, comes to see Solomon. In 2 Chronicles 9, if you're there with me, in the very first verse, it says, Now the, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions. Now, I don't think, you know, this lady is any slouch. She's the leader of a country. I don't think she got there uh, by accident, so to speak, I, I in some commentaries have a little bit to say about this, but she's a sharp individual, and she's coming again to test Solomon. It says with hard questions, and she comes with this uh, great caravan. Now, end of verse 1, it says, when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. She must have been pondering things 
maybe for a long time in life, things that no one else could answer. And so she brings it to Solomon. Now, it's amazing if you read on with me in verse 2, so Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. I find that amazing. He didn't once have to say, well, that one I can't figure out. Or, you know, I'm going to have to study that. If you just take this verse at face value, there was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he couldn't explain it. Verse 3, and when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, and then she sees the house and everything that he had built, notice what it says in the end of verse 4. When she saw all of this, especially heard his wisdom, there was no more spirit in her. She was left, I don't know how to put it, flabbergasted. Breathless, perhaps you, you could say. She was just astounded at what she had learned from this man. It left her in awe. Let's skip to verses 22 and 23, getting on towards the end of the chapter. Verse 22. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Now, just imagine, just imagine all the kings, it says. All the kings sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom. But what's the source of it? which God had put in his heart. That's enough of the background about the author. Solomon was the object of great praise. He was sought after because of his wisdom. We read enough about that. When you think about it, I think it is hard to remain humble when you are constantly being sought by others who are national leaders, and no doubt some or many of them were very wise, and yet they're coming to Solomon because he knows more. It doesn't excuse what he did late in life, but I think it's easy to see how he could stumble. When you're that sharp, Maybe you reach a point where you don't need God or any longer respect him. But for you and me, here's why we need to study the Proverbs. And I have resolved to get more serious about this as I really delved into it this time. Even though Solomon ended badly, and by the way, you've heard ministers say this before, and I'm going to say the same thing. We really don't know where Solomon will stand when he appears before the judgment seat of Christ. Dr. Erwiller also made that statement. We just don't know. Uh, the end of the book of Ecclesiastes in particular indicates maybe this old man had Although, he again, he wasn't that old, but maybe at end of life, he did come to see his errors. Uh, no need to dwell on that because we just don't know. However, why we sh should we study the, uh, the Proverbs? Because we are reading the words of a man who was given wisdom by God beyond any, remember what we read, that was before him or after him. So, having said that, I have a couple of comments. You know, I, I, I had to reflect, too, on some people I've had dealing with in my life. Nothing like Solomon, but I was thinking of an individual I certainly won't name, and he's deceased now, but he was an extremely successful man. But his personal life was a mess. But you know what? When I think back, and I was meditating about this, specific to his business, 
specific to fi and finance wasn't his business, but specific to his trade or profession and even finance, he, he was so successful. He knew how to invest money. I would have taken advice from that, that man any day of the week, although I wouldn't have managed my personal life as he did. I have another example. How many of you have, those of you I can see, raise your hand. How many of you have a lot of respect for Ben Franklin, one of America's founding fathers? I do. I do. The man was astounding. You know the story about the kite and discovering electricity. Are you aware he invented some musical instruments? He was, I mean, I could go on and on. He invented a stove. Very common today, but what came to be known as the Franklin stove was brand new then. Replaced fireplaces and open fires. I could go on and on. He was an amazing writer. Remember poor Richard's Almanac? Just an amazing man with such a breadth of knowledge. And yet, if you read some of, of the honestly written background and even his own autobiography, he admits to some real character flaws. So maybe that helps you a little bit again, thinking about Solomon, but I have learned a lot from Benjamin Franklin. I have loved reading about him off and on throughout my life, but much more Solomon. So now, in the time remaining, I'm going to go into a specific theme, or now let me uh, put that a little differently. I'm going to cover a specific topic this evening, and I'll show you how it flows out in the book of Proverbs. It's not going to be in one chapter. It's not going to be in two or three. Here a little, there a little. But I think it's amazing, and I picked a basic one. In the future, I'd like to go through a few or several of these with you, but tonight I picked a basic one. We constantly hear things today such as, there just aren't many people out there who want to work anymore. Don't you hear that frequently? I hear that over and over and over right now. Or I hear things, people are given a job. I was told one of these stories just recently. They had applied for and had been given a job. And when the day came, they didn't even show up. You probably have stories to tell. Or they start a job. My brother was recently telling me one of these stories. Start a job, but show up with no attitude of real commitment or diligence or energy to do the work. So I want to do a brief, and this won't cover every scripture in Proverbs that deals with this topic, but I want to go through a brief study of diligence and industry personal industry in the book of Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs 10 and verse 4. This is timeless. Proverbs 10 and verse 4. I'll actually read two verses here, verses 4 and 5, but if you're now in Proverbs 10 with me. First of all, verse 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Now, that doesn't mean instant wealth will come to you, but here's another translation of uh, verse 4. Idle hands make one poor. Listen, if you're going to make a living, you have to get out there and work. It says, but diligent hands bring wealth, and over a period of time, it brings success. Now, that's from the uh, Berean Study Bible. Verse uh, 5, he who gathers in summer is a wise son. 
He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Now, quite often in Scripture, we see lessons built around agriculture. And here's one of them. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest, again, is a son who causes shame. And I was thinking back. I grew up on a farm. All of you know that. I did know a couple of neighbors who slept in, even during harvest. They didn't retire very comfortably. As a matter of fact, one didn't survive as a farmer. But I think there's even simple application of this. When it's time to harvest, you've got to be out there and get it done. Let me put it as simply as I can. Even asparagus and rhubarb teach us this. Depends a little bit on weather, but asparagus and rhubarb can go from being succulent and tasty to hard and woody in just a day or so, can't they? You know, what are some of the lessons here? I remember uh, my mother being so diligent in going out to pick asparagus because it, it could go so rapidly from this tender stalk, so tasty, to something hard and losing its taste and not palatable. Well, when the time comes, when the time is right to do something, you have to be ready and get out there and do it. Proverbs 13 and verse 4. Proverbs 13 and verse 4. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. And again, being diligent may not make you instantly rich, but you stay at it and you will prosper. Here's another, tra I, I have found modern translations to be helpful sometimes when you're reading the book of Proverbs. Here's the New Living Translation. Lazy people want much, but get little. Oh, I know a lot of people that want much, but the laziness gets in the way. They want much, but get little. And continuing, but those who work hard will prosper. And that is a timeless law. You are rewarded for working hard. In Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. Here a little, there a little. But I'm sticking with the same topic, the study of diligence and being industrious here in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 24. Verse 30 through 34. Now, here we have a few verses with continuity. So again, verse 30. I went by the field of the lazy man, and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. Here's another translation. I walked by the field of a lazy person, the vineyard of one with no common sense. That's probably a reasonably good understanding as well. What did he see? Next verse, verse 31. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. So he's looking at property that is just falling apart. Just falling apart. Because, again, it says it was the field of a lazy man. But ladies, there are lessons here for you as well. You know, if a hinge is getting loose on the barn, and I thought of my own father doing this, he was quick to tighten it up, renail it. 
or rebolt it, depending on how it was fastened. I remember him doing that on more than one occasion. Then I got a little older, and I started working out. And I worked for a farmer that didn't repair anything until the door fell off. I, 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 I'll be careful here. I don't want to collapse into sarcasm, but it's a true story. Or sagging so bad, the latch no longer worked. Well, I, I sometimes I was frustrated with Dad's demands of diligence. But later in life, I was sure grateful because I learned from that. That's what Solomon was seeing. These lessons, again, are so timeless. Verse 32, when I saw it, I considered it well. He thought about this. I looked on it and received instruction. What did he receive? What led to this? That's what he's pondering. He answers, verse 33, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Now, we all have to get adequate rest to maintain our health. I do want to mention that. But you know what? There comes a time when you've got to get up and get going. How many of you learned that as young people? I did. <laughs> I just wasn't allowed to lie in bed too long because there were cows to milk, calves to feed, or fields to till, or hay to bale, or whatever happened to be the season. A little sleep. Hit the snooze button, <laughs> my modern translation, once or twice. A little folding of the hands to rest. I think I, oh, I'm going to lean back here, take it easy today. And verse 34, so shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Here's a, I neglected to... Uh, Note which translation uh, this was from, but the last part of the last verse I read is rendered this way in another translation. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. It's pretty strong, isn't it? But that is what happens if you lose diligence or never develop it and lose industriousness. Proverbs 12, we're working back now. Proverbs 12, same topic, but just building on it a little bit. Proverbs 12 and verse 11. Proverbs 12, verse 11. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread. He'll be satisfied, in other words, with the food that comes from it. But he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. Now, you might have to ponder that a little bit. You may want to look at it in other translations. I copied in one into my notes from the New English translation. The one who works his field will have plenty of food. But whoever chases daydreams lacks wisdom. Have you known folks who are constantly dreaming? Dreaming of something different and better. While the work at hand never gets done. I think of my own dear wife and her garden. I'll just change gender. She who tills her land will be satisfied with bread and other produce out of the garden. I, you know, it's, it's a simple thing, and I, there are far bigger lessons here, too. But when the time is right to get out there, and of course, you know, today the lessons here are a little harder to follow for many of us. We're not all that tied to the land. But in an era where there were not supermarkets, 
and sources of food readily available, then he who tills his land is going to be satisfied with food as a result of it. But the one who's thinking, oh, I think I'll go golfing today. Not that it's wrong to golf, but when it's time to work, it's time to work, and that is first priority. Any of you remember the story I told about our son? When he first went to work in his trade as a, a, a diesel tech, he was working in a truck engine shop, Rapid City, South Dakota. And a trucker hauling live cattle pulled into that shop shortly before 5 p.m., which was the quitting time for the day shift. It was hot. As I recall, near 100 degrees, and that's a very dry climate out there. And he's got live cattle on this truck, and he did not have misters. And if you don't know what that is, it's a little system that spray a mist of water up in that cattle trailer to keep the cattle cool. He did not have that option. So he's very worried about these cattle, but the water pump is going out of his truck and he can't go any further with the, because of the semi-tractor having a failing water pump. The service manager immediately recognized his problem. And he turns to a young man, a mechanic, and tells him, get out and get that water pump off and get a new pump on that truck so we can get this man on the road. This is a true story and I'm quoting as accurately as I remember it from my own son. The young man said, I can't. I have a tea time, meaning tea time at the local golf course at 5.30. It's a true story. I find that almost impossible to believe, but I do believe my son. The service manager was so angry, <laughs> he turned, and our son just happened to be standing by. He was also set to get off at five. He said, Paul, get out there and replace that water pump. And hey, our son isn't a perfect man, but I will tell you, he did apply this proverb. He wasn't going to follow frivolity, got the water pump changed on that truck, and got that man on the road so that air flowing through the trailer would keep those cattle alive. It's an astounding story, isn't it? But it's true. Proverbs 21. Kind of builds on that thought. Proverbs 21 and verse 17. Verse 17. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Now, again, it's a, there's something a little bit difficult to pull out of this. It's not wrong to have some wine or oil with which, you know, we make foods and put oil in them. But let's talk about the first part. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. I also knew a gentleman, he's now deceased, but I knew him uh, in the community not far from here. He once bluntly said, work is overrated. But boy, did he love pleasure. He died a pauper, sadly, lost his wife and family. He just wouldn't work. Now, out of a commentary, let me uh, comment a little bit about the second part. He, he who loves wine and oil. This is from Barnes' notes in the Bible, wine and oil. He writes, these are the costly adjuncts of a princely banquet, the price of oil or precious, uh, precious unguent was about equal to the 300 days wages of a field laborer. 
And so indulgence in such a luxury would uh, thus would become a type of all extravagance and excess. So that helps expand on that a little bit. This love for wine and oil, it's for the, the, the banquet, something that costs far too much for what you're going to get out of it. Let's see, I think I will have to pick and choose. I'll never be able to, uh, to read all of these. Let's turn back um, Proverbs 18 and verse 9. Proverbs 18, verse 9. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Now, you know, that here's, a, here's a, another modern translation, the Christian Standard Bible. The one who is lazy in his work is brother to a vandal. Excuse me, that seems awfully strong, doesn't it? Here's something from Gill's exposition on the Bible. He says this is a comparison to the prodigal son. You remember what was stated about the prodigal son. He wasted everything he was given, remember, on riotous living. And later on, his brother said he was wasting his money, his inheritance with prostitutes. Now, Gill continues, the sluggard and the prodigal are brothers in iniquity, for though they take different courses, they are both sinful. This puts laziness, if you will, in a very, very bad light. Here's one that Let's turn to Proverbs 19. Here's one that stretches your imagination a little bit. I'm not sure I've ever known anyone quite this lazy, but, and I'm sure it's an exaggeration for effect, but in Proverbs 19, verse 15. Proverbs 19, verse 15. Slothfulness. Um, casts one into a deep sleep, a deep sleep. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown says that this is a state of utter indifference. Remember in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, and I'll just uh, ask you to note that, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, Paul actually counseled, when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Now, those are the words of the Apostle Paul. But while we're in uh, Proverbs 19, please glance at verse 24. This is the one that stretches my imagination. And again, I know it's something of an exaggeration for effect, but it says, verse 24, a lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. In other words, reaches in deep, and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. <laughs> Has anyone uh, known a person lazy to that degree? Well, again, I think, and, and uh, Matthew Poole's commentary says, this is sarcastic hyperbole, meaning the man will not so much as bring his hand to his mouth again to feed himself, he expects that the meat or the food should drop into his mouth. <laughs> Solomon wrote some amazing things, but it certainly gets your attention here. Proverbs 20. Just two more, if you would indulge me. Proverbs 20 and verse 4, the very next proverb here. Proverbs 20, verse 4. This one jumped out at me because of my background. I think it'll make sense to some of you. The lazy man will not plow because of winter or because of cold. And the second part, as a result, he will beg during harvest and have nothing. Any of you farm boys remember, as I do, Having to do tillage or planting 
sitting out and in that era when I grew up, and it would be the same for many of you, we had no cabs. A tractor cab was all but unheard of. We sat on open tractors to do the tillage or the planting. I wasn't old enough to plant. Dad did that, but I did some tillage. When it was so miserably cold, <laughs> you had on two or three layers, and you still at times had to get off and stand on the downwind side of the tractor by the engine to warm up. Does, anyone, does that resonate with anyone? <laughs> Some of you raise your hands. I'm, I'm glad you do. But if you didn't do that, there was no harvest, and that was our livelihood. I remember a neighbor, and Dad enjoyed quoting him. He and that neighbor were pretty close. But the old neighbor said, if you don't plant corn with your overcoat on and your overshoes, you're not going to get a good crop. In our short growing seasons, you know, he recognized that. And if it was cold, he went out just the same. But now, you know, th this is a principle, though, for other trades or professions. You know, builders can't wait for good weather to start a project, right? You keep waiting, and pretty soon the season's about over. And you haven't gotten much built. I mean, I, I could go on and on. Proverbs 22, verse 13. I'll end with this one for tonight. Proverbs 22, verse 13. The lazy man says, there is a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. I can't go out there. It's too dangerous. Now and again, you know, exaggeration, I think, but always finding a reason not to go out and to get the job done. But here, it defines it right at the beginning of the verse. The lazy man says, he's looking for a way out, always making excuses. How much these simple principles are needed by the world today? Don't you agree with me? How much this is needed, and it's not being taught anymore, at least not a lot. Simple to understand, I feel, but sometimes pretty hard to apply. Get up and get going. You can't keep hitting the snooze button. You can't keep hoping for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow without doing something to earn a living. You have to get up and get going, even when it hurts. Now, I'm not counseling anyone to abuse themselves, but you will be rewarded. So I'll confine this one topic in Proverbs to what I've presented to you tonight, and I would like to go on parts two or three. We'll see how far to go to look at other uh, topics of interest, because there are many in the book of Proverbs. So for now, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, thank everyone who will watch this in the future. I hope that you find it profitable. Uh, so for now, thank you, everyone. And we will begin a discussion in a moment after I stop the recording.